we've all had we've all had to that, deal with doubt. It seems like it's just a common part of of our Christian walk. We have to deal with a certain amount of doubt. And we have a certain amount of levels of different levels of doubt. Um, but when we get to that point of doubt where we start to wonder if everything that we believe, or everything that we've thought of, is it really true? We don't know what to think about what we've lived our lives doing. Where it's just like, I don't even know if what I've been doing for all these years, if it was, if it was true, if it was real. And we really don't know about anything at that point. And this is where, where David is at in Psalm 42. Now looking at this psalm, and it's going through studying different things, but it's a lot of different angles. And with, with any song, there's always lots of different directions and lots of different thoughts on it. And when I just typed into Psalm 42, there was a lot of information that came up uh, for mental health hospitals and uh, dealing with depression and all the mental stress and things that go with that. But the psalm itself starts off, and it says, Maskil for the sons of Korah. And this brings up a bunch of issues on who wrote it and who was the author. But it seems to be that David would be the standout. The masculine, it was, wasn't put on every psalm. But what it means is something that's instructional, enlightenment, or scholarly. So this is something that we're supposed to learn from, from, this, from this particular psalm. And we'll see a few psalm, psalms that say, Sons of Korah. And I really wanted to get into that, but it was like really long. It would take almost an entire sermon just to explain how these sons of Korah came to be. So just a quick explanation is they were really good singers. But they would, only certain songs were given to this particular choral group called the Sons of Korah, Korah and this is what one of them. So as we get into the actual psalm itself, it says, as the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food. Day and night, while men say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the multitude, leading the procession through the to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. And really to get kind of a backstory on this, to see where David goes, or has been through to get to where he's writing this psalm, we have to look at Absalom and the story that goes on there in 2 Samuel. And it actually goes back a little bit farther than, than just the story of Absalom. But what we see is Absalom is in, a, is in another, is in a foreign country, in a city, and he's hiding from David. He's killed his brother, Ammonon, earlier for raping his sister. And rather than Absalom not knowing what David would do, he took off. And after years of this being gone, basically hiding from David, one of David's confidants, Joab, comes to him and says, you should have your son here with you in Jerusalem. And after petitioning David on and on, he finally says, fine, you can go get Absalom, bring him back to Jerusalem. I don't want to see him, though. He can be here, but I don't want to see him. So after he brings Absalom back to Jerusalem, for two years he's not seen David. After a while, Absalom goes to David, goes to Joab and says, why am I even here if I haven't seen my father? I haven't seen the king. So after petitioning David again, he says, fine, bring him to me and I'll meet him. When he comes into the room, Absalom falls on the floor before him. David, seeing his son and not having seen him for years, picks him up off the floor, hugs him and kisses him. At this time, David feels Maybe we're back on the reconciliation with my son. My family can be complete again. Absalom says, can I go to another city back to, I believe it was Gershon, where he told them, he told people there that he would come to 
worship with them if he was ever restored back to Jerusalem? David said, that's fine. If you made an obligation, fulfill that, and then come back. At this point, this is all been a lie. Absalom had no intentions of going anywhere. Instead, he goes down by the gates of the city, and as people were coming in, to tell they would bring, they would come into the king or some representative of the palace, and they would bring their disputes and their problems, and the king or one of his representatives would talk to them. Absalom would sit at the gate, and when people would come up, he said, there's nobody here to talk to you. The king's too busy. None of his representatives are here. But if I was in charge, if I was a ruler, it wouldn't be like this. I know what you people are feeling. You know, he's a man of the people now. He's down there, the king, oh, he's too much, you know, he's royalty now. And, you know, you need to be with, you know, somebody like me. If I was in charge, things would be totally different. So as this is going on, one of David's servants starts to notice what Absalom's doing. And he goes and tells David, Absalom has turned the people's hearts towards him and away from you. And at that point, David realizes this has all been a, all been a plot from the beginning. So David takes all, takes all of his family, some of his servants, and the people that were loyal to him, and they take off again. And he heads out into the wilderness. They're going across the Kidron Valley, and they're heading towards... Mount Zion. Now as David is leaving, he's walking, he takes off his, his shoes, he covers his head, and he cries as he's, as he's leaving Jerusalem. David covers his things. In the first part of the psalm, David covers the essentials for his life. He talks about panting the air and wanting the water. And then he's replaced his food with tears and worship the essentials in David's life become air, water, food, and worship. As if worship were his food, and this is something that he needs to survive. He needs these four things. David would lead the people from the gates and bring them into the temple for worship, and this has been taken from him. Being able to worship openly in God's temple has been taken from him. And now, He's completely heartbroken, not only from having this taken from him, his family and all of his servants and him are on the run again. Now, he's completely heartbroken with this. And this is where we get into the next section of the psalm. And this is where you start reading this next section, you can see why we type in, why they start talking about, are you depressed? Do you need help? Mental issues. And starting in the fifth verse of Psalm 42, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of Jordan, from the heights of Ramon, to Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep. In the roar of your waterfalls, all of your waves and breakers have swept over me. Now, as we look at this part, he's, David is actually arguing with himself here. And if you look, remember that old, maybe some of you heard that old song, that Why So Downcast, Oh My Soul? You know, it's like a real, real snappy little chorus thing. That is the total opposite of what's going on here. We're quoting when that song is quoting this, but it's hardly a happy situation. David is arguing with himself. Why are you so downcast? Why are you downcast, my soul? And he's just completely overwhelmed by the situation that he's in. Where he's having an argument between his intellect and his emotion, between his head and his heart. He's having this problem. Why are you downcast? But trusting God, at the same time he's back and forth. He knows what God has done for him in the past. He knows who God is. But yet he sees this overwhelming situation that he's in. And he has this battle with his own emotions over what's going on. And you have to think when you get to that point of reading this, is have I ever been in this situation myself? Have any of you ever been in the point where you're in a situation, the point you're asking, is God even here? Is God with me at all? This, why is this? Why am I going through this? I know who God is. I know what I, who I worship. But then at the same time, why do I have to go through this? In the first 
first section of the psalm, David is longing for God, wanting him, wanting to be with him, but asking why. Why am I here? Why am I in this situation again? He's already been through this on the run with, with, the, with Saul chasing after him, wanting him dead. And now he's on the run from his own son who wants to take over his kingdom. As we get into the second section, he's remembering what God has done. But he tells his own spirit, I will worship anyway. And as he talks to God, he says, my soul is downcast within me. But I will remember you anyway. And he goes back and forth with himself. Trust and hope in God. But he tells the Spirit, why won't you get him on board with this? Why? So this ongoing battle that he has with himself. And we've been in a situation where everything is going good. This is kind of where David's at. Think about our own lives and putting ourselves in the situation that David's in. Everything was going good for David. His kingdom, there was no problems, no drama going on. Everything was well. His son had come back, and at this point, he basically feels the reconciliation. Everything's good. Maybe he can relax a little bit. Have you ever been at that point where it's like, okay, there's no drama in my life. Everything's going good. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Everything's fine. Then all of a sudden, the rug gets yanked out from under out of nowhere, and that's usually what it happens when you least expect it, just when you think you can relax. And David says, all the waves and breakers have swept over me. Where he's been totally overwhelmed by the situation that he's in. As we get into the third section of this, it says, by day the Lord directs his love. At night his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to, to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning and oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony, and my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior, my God. And at the beginning, it seems like he's trying to convince himself. He's talking about the Lord directs his love to me. His song is with me at night. But then he says, I prayer, I pray to my God. And right back into it, why have you forgotten me? He's almost having this schizophrenic thing where he's going from one side to the other constantly. Just when he starts thinking, well, God's love is with me. I'm going to pray to my Savior. And then why did he forget me? Why have you left me alone? Why am I in agony? And to look at this, to try to relate to David's pain of questioning God and questioning himself. What have I been doing? Is everything that I've done, is it real? Is all the work and the worship and everything that I've brought into my life, is it true? But has God forgotten me? And he's trying to hold on to the faith that he's got, trying to hold on to it, trying to convince him in his spirit that God is taking care of him and God will take care of him. Where is your God? This is a common taunt that the Gentiles would have for the, for the Jews. And it was ongoing because how many times were the Jews in and out of captivity, in and out of being enslaved? Where is your God? Every time David comes back to the same old argument, why so downcast my soul? Why are you so disturbed within me? Trying to feel what David goes through, and this just in our own doubts and the things that we go through, bad situations that we may have to may have to endure, where we possibly start to doubt what God has for us. He says, yet I will praise him. Yet I will praise him. Why would God allow this? Why would God let me go through this? And the same taunt all the time. We hear this. We hear it even today. Where is God? Where is he at? Every time there's a, some sort of tragedy or some sort of natural disaster of things, everybody, well, why did God let this happen? 
where was God when this was going on? Anyone that would make this statement doesn't understand that at the point that sin entered the world, that everything was corrupt. Our lives, our bodies, nature itself was corrupted at this point. Why we have sickness, we have illness, we have diseases, we have natural disasters, earthquakes, flooding, because of the corruptness. Where is God in this? David says, you have forgotten me. Job says in the third chapter, may the day of my birth perish. And the night it was said, boy is born, that day may it turn to darkness. May God above not care about it. May no light shine upon it. Jeremiah says in the 20th chapter, Cursed is the day I was born. May the day my mother bore me not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought my father's news, news to my father, who made him very glad by saying, A child is born to you, a son. So what do we do in this position? If we're in a situation in our own lives where we're beginning to doubt, we're beginning to wonder what God has for us. What does God have for us? And most people, and myself included, don't exactly want to hear, well, the Lord is making you more like Jesus when you're cursing the day you were born. It may be true, but who wants to hear, well, we're just making you a little bit more like Jesus. That's not really something you want to hear at that point. What we can do is look at David's intellectual argument at this point, not the emotional side. He says to trust. He says to hope. To praise God. And this is one of those things that sometimes trust and the hope to praise God, maybe we even have to force it. We have to make it happen. Because he tells his own spirit, I will praise him anyway. I will praise him. As he argues with himself. And sometimes we do have to force ourselves to, to worship. To trust make ourselves do it. Sometimes when you're going through the hardest part of your life, the last place you want to be is in church. I've been to that situation where it's like, I really just don't feel like I can deal with anybody. I don't particularly feel like I can be in church. But forcing myself into that situation, coming in and actually hearing the songs, hearing the word, hearing the prayers, and just holding on tight to what I know not listening to my heart. In Hebrews it said, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess and he who promised is faithful. When we're in these situations, a situation like David is, sometimes all we can do is hold on and wait. Now it's not a very greatly profound answer, but sometimes all we have, all we can do is try to get ourselves in a place of obedience and just ride out the storm. Ride out the situation that we're in until we're back around. In Thessalonians, it says, be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. And these things are really hard, especially when you're in a bad situation. Praying continually, depending on your situation, sometimes it's hard to even pray. Sometimes it's hard to even start into a prayer when you're in a position of doubting what God has for you. Giving thanks. Also, why am I going, why should I be giving thanks when I'm in these situations? Again, these are things that we have to force sometimes just to get us over that hump. Being joyful. That's probably one of the most difficult things when you're in this. And the word, you know, we see joyful. I don't know, when I see joyful, I think jazz hands. Okay, here we go. We're always happy and smiling. We're in the show choir. All right. But it's just that, just being happy with knowing who God is and knowing intellectually, not following that emotion at this point when you're really down. Where is God? Second Corinthians says, We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. 
near, he's guaranteeing, Paul just he's putting it out, we are guaranteed in our Christian life we are going to have problems. He says it right here. But we will be struck down but not destroyed. Isaiah says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I will be with you. In Hebrews it says, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Whatever it may cause us to doubt, whatever may be causing us to have this feeling of where is God? Where is he in my storm? Where is he in my problems? When we look at this, he is faithful with what he's promised. He's faithful with what, what he's going to have for us. He says, when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. I am with you. It may not feel like he's there. It may not it may feel like everything's lost and we're all alone. But he is right there with us. He's right there with us always. He says, I will never leave you. As we come into a time of communion, now we might be, some of us might be in that position right now where it's like, I don't know where God's at. I don't know where he's at in my life. I don't know what he's got. It's just, I'm here by myself. I'm on my own with us. If that's the way you feel, this is the time to actually take it to him. You know, just, Lord, I feel like I'm alone on this. I need your help. I need your presence. We have to remember that he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can know in our hearts and our minds that you are with us. That you won't leave us. That you will be with us no matter how bad things